Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Carl Pearson of Who Knives. Carl started Who Knives with a very specific mission to create folders that could be legally carried in England and Germany with designs and features that today's knife enthusiasts look for in EDC knives. A seemingly daunting challenge indeed. After the very successful first run of folders with the V1 model, Who Knives is back with their decidedly tactical feeling V2 model. We're gonna talk with Carl about the challenges of knife uh, that knife lovers face in England and what it's like to start a modern pocket knife company there. But first, let's uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so by visiting us on Patreon. Check out the exclusives and extras you get by doing so. Quickest way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. Hi, Carl. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I was really happy to see recently on Instagram the uh, release of the V2, the Who Knives V2. Uh, congratulations on that, sir. Tell, tell us uh, tell us what, what the V2 is and what your design goals were with that. Of course. Thank you uh, very much as well for those kind words. So... Essentially, in the United Kingdom, um, which includes Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and Wales, uh, just this big map up here actually, the knife laws are quite strict. I know some parts of the, the US are relatively similar, but a bit more lenient than ourselves, uh, such as New York, and I know California has uh, rules in place on specific knives as well. So, in the UK, you can only really have a small pocket knife. The blade needs to be under three inches, the cutting edge. And it has to be non-locking as well. So, that puts out things like the small Sebenza. Unfortunately, without a good reason, you couldn't carry that in the United Kingdom. So, the main uh, logic behind this is it can be carried in the United Kingdom, no matter where you are, is unless it's one of these uh, protected locations like a school, etc., for obvious reasons, and it's a non-locking folding knife, but it can also be deployed just by flicking it as well. And uh, famously, Spyderco have the Spidey flick, don't they? Well, you can actually do that on this as well, <laughs> mm -hmm. because the thumb stud is on both sides. So, okay, so you're in, where Where are you located? So I'm based in Scotland. I was actually born in England um, and I'm based in, in Scotland, but our laws around knives are actually the exact same because okay. it's dealt with down in Westminster for the entire United Kingdom. So you said, uh, you, you used the example of a small Sabenza, mm, you yeah. know, the, the, the standard for luxury knife. Um, uh, you said that that is, um, you know, not permitted without a good reason. What's what's a good reason? Of so that would be for a court a court to define. And unfortunately, because I'm not a judge or uh, a jury that's been called in, uh, I couldn't make that assessment. It would be down to the particular situation. But for example, um, one might give a good reason as bushcraft. Now, it would be up to the court to decide whether that would be an applicable reason or not. They could uh, very likely say, well, that's not a good enough reason to carry such a knife, or it is. It really depends on that court and the scenario. You know, I don't think uh, 
the goal of the law is for average Joes that are carrying a pocket knife to be picked up and arrested, but unfortunately, Mm -hmm. it has had those consequences in some cases because, you know, when... The, the law is defined in such a way that not everybody maybe understands it or fully looks into it. You know, for example, when my father was born in 1945, he wouldn't have uh, batted an eyelid twice at carrying a lock and knife in the United Kingdom for doing his work, etc. But with the way things have uh, came about in big cities such as London with a uh, rise in knife crime, etc., this is why uh, we have such harsh legislation i don't want to be too critical of it because i'm not a lawyer or a legal expert but i do think that the legislation doesn't give much wiggle room to play with unfortunately yeah and and the other unfortunate thing is that uh, the law doesn't account for the fact well thankfully the law doesn't account for the fact that knives are essential tools that are uh Mm. spread across our lives you know kitchen knives we use every day. As a matter of fact, those are the knives that get used in knife crime the most. Yes. Uh, kitchen knives. But but you can't outlaw kitchen knives. You know, what 100%. are you going to do? So the people who suffer are the people who make uh, cool pocket knives, <laughs> you know, locking pocket knives. Like, uh, it, so it kind of doesn't make sense to me because those aren't really the, the right. knives that are that crimes are being done with. A hundred percent is the exact same in the United Kingdom. The majority of knife crime is committed by kitchen knives, which are easily affordable. They're, without being too crude, they're made to to butcher meat in a lot of cases, so you can imagine the kind of impact they would have in an attack on someone. Whereas, you know, and I'm not saying that they're not dangerous in the wrong hands, but you compare this to your standard kitchen devil, there's no comparison in in terms of... uh, you know, size and and malice and fear that that could cause in in somebody's mind. But unfortunately, in the United Kingdom, we do we do have these laws, so we kind of have to work within the parameters that have been set out. Uh, I would be all for personally campaigning to have uh, less uh, tough laws, but I don't think there's an appetite the same mm-hmm. way as there is in the United States. We yeah. don't have as much of a impact in, in politics per se as a uh, y- your kind of average state in the united states um so we're left with that issue <laughs> yeah we are lucky in the united states to have uh the likes of doug ritter and knife rights an organization mm. that has that has really been working state by state to eliminate um laws that were put in place just post-slavery uh, uh to stop to wow. stop uh you know the 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 general pe- public and and african americans from owning knives and that has affected you know and then these crazy laws that came from the 50s after james mm-hmm. dean had his switchblade uh knife fight and rebel without a cause yeah um so your knives now um so you have a a real design challenge here um i want to talk about your your past and your love of knives but mm. But your real design challenge here is to take some of the um, features of the knives that you love that you may not own or buy, Mm -hmm. uh, but put them in the context, uh, put them in the package that will be acceptable to law. So what are those things? Tell me how you've gotten around the laws. and So to have a flip knife in in the United Kingdom, a knife that deploys with such ease like this, is going to be tough if you're using a traditional slip joint mechanism, something like I did bring some with me, like your uh, Spyderco UKPK, traditionally, you know, well not traditionally, but a a classic kind of uh, British everyday carry that many people do use specifically designed for here of course but that is of course a slip joint so you can't exactly flip that that out this is a little bit different it works on a uh, ball bearings and it's a double detent if you give me two wee seconds i actually deconstructed one just before coming oh, on cool just to to show yourself in the audience how how they work there is more in-depth th- photos on our social media etc but essentially what happens is your ball bearings, of course, will go here. And uh, you can flip, sorry, I'm making sure it's in, and it'll come out like this. And the detent will catch the knife in these little holes. Okay. And hold it and hold it in place. And it can be pretty firm. Um, 
so it's not like your traditional your traditional slip joint that has you know your kind. It's all designed into the back spring, essentially. Uh, this is designed into the actual handle itself, uh, the mechanism. And- and it looks like there's a little sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, lock bar that applies pressure uh, exactly. with the ball bearing into the little mm. hole so that there's tension so that when you hit that flipper, there's enough tension built up uh, with that spring in the Absolutely. in the detent hole. Uh, that's cool. And it flips. I never quite understood how it, I don't have any double detent knives and I never quite understood. I'd love to change that. I'd love to change <laughs> that. Yeah, you, let's, <laughs> let's, let's definitely change that. Hold up the knife. Uh, that you were flipping that had the nice lanyard on it. Um, so and, this and is, tell us uh, about this. This is the Who Knives V1. This was the first knife I, I ever designed, and it took inspiration from quite a lot of, of knives, just like you say, that you couldn't necessarily own in the United Kingdom. Or I say own. You can own them, but you can't carry them for everyday use without a, a good reason. So, for example, I do have a Sebenza here, but I couldn't take that outside without a good reason. So it limits its use to kind of house and work, whereas this can be can, can be carried everywhere. It works on the same system as this. It's a double detent. And the idea behind it was just to have quite a nice gentlemanly knife that wouldn't look very offensive, wouldn't maybe, you know, scare any people off who weren't really knife enthusiasts. <clears throat> and it's quite a, I don't know, it's quite a slim, it's it's not super slim, but it's got this kind of sleek feel to it, I feel like anyway, that uh, any gentleman can kind of slip this in his pocket and know it's there to quickly slice open a box or something like that if needs be that got, that oh. one took apologies no no that one uh, this is the third or fourth iteration of this knife even though i call it the v1 we've messed about with quite a lot of things on it just to kind of get them pitch perfect for example this was one of the first v1s ever created and you'll notice that the pocket clip's different mm-hmm. This was a titanium pocket clip, sorry, but what we noticed about this was they're really loose, and we actually had reports that one had slipped out of somebody's pocket. Uh-uh. Um, so when you're making a titanium, a lot of it was trial and error because this was my first design, but when you're making a titanium uh, pocket clip, it really needs to be something like the Sebenza, really thick and stocky to, to mm. kind of hold that rigidity. Whereas this uh, was too flimsy, so we updated that to the stainless steel clip nice. um, there. And the detent as well has also been messed about with. This detent, which is on the V2, is also on um, the newest iteration of the V1. But the first V1 had a much weaker detent. So, for example, I could, you know, really, it doesn't take much force at all to close that. And the saving grace was you had your flipper tab there to stop it from closing on you. But with this one, it takes much more pressure um, to a- apply to it. So a lot of it was, was trial and error with us, but we got there in the end. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. So which is which is the end? The one that you ha- had mm. that's harder to close? Yeah, um, that's right. So essentially, cause... we want it to be as safe as possible you know, uh, when in hand. So we want it to be much more difficult to, to close on you. We want those detents to have a nice firm grip on, on the blade because, of course, we can't have locking knives, but we want to make it as safe as possible. To... Yeah, sure. Despite that fact that uh, a lot of the United States or abroad might be thinking, well, surely a lock and folding knife would be the safest option. Why would... Why would the government or parliament legislate against that? And that's a question I can't answer. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I don't understand that either. Um, uh, but uh, another thing that you've reached by tweaking that uh, detent and making it safer is that you've also uh, reached locking knife levels of fidgetability with the yes. closing. You know what I mean? Uh and that's well, that's also part of the experience that you're missing if you're if you're not allowed to have these knives or you know, carry them. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the inspirations you might you might have seen this knife. I believe it's called the EZC 2.0. It's by yes. NBK, um, and that 
the V1 took a lot of inspiration from this because I, I received this must be about two or three years ago now and I just fell in love with it you know I, everything about it I loved how easy it was to open and um, how quickly I could just pull it out the pocket and get something done with it and that's what I kind of wanted to factor into a UK legal uh, which I just couldn't find on the market that there, there was some options but none that kind of had that um, factor for me that really done it that that made me want to go and pull the trigger on that knife, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's what I tried to set out to achieve here. Uh, what about materials? Did you have mm. material, uh, certain materials in mind? Obviously, you like the titanium, but in terms of blade steel and stuff like that, how does that work? So when I initially um, lo looked into the manufacturing process, I was uh, worried that, the cost of manufacturing would outweigh the kind of appetite for people wanting to buy one of these uh, knives off myself. But as I, I dive deeper into it, I realised that we probably could have done a more, uh, we, we could do a more premium knife with titanium and M390, and that's what uh, both the V1 and V2 actually have. Uh, it's funny you ask about the materials because there was a thought process and I did have different things going through my head when doing the V2 because the prototypes for the V2 uh, they're marked with a P but it's actually I don't know if you can see that it's S35 yep. uh, VN so we did mess about or I did mess about with the steel but I just came back to M390 because it's just such a good all round steel and I've never had any complaints from any customers saying, you know, it's had this issue, it's had that issue. Uh, so I I put my faith for these in, in M390 and I think it's done very well. It's held up uh, well and it's a, great, it's a great steel. It really, really is. There's so many out there uh, that on the market nowadays and there's new ones coming out quite often but m390 in, in my opinion is just a great all-round steel yeah it is and um i i think that it makes the most sense to put those kind of super super performing steels on everyday carry knives that you're mm. going to you know i i have a i have a pretty sizable collection of knives that i carry w once in a while because i rotate um and a lot of them, it doesn't make sense to have this super high-end yeah. blade steel uh, because I'm not using them enough. But the but mm -hmm. the slip joints that I always drop in my pocket, um, you know, for instance, I've been carrying Jack Wolf knives a lot recently, and and they're M390, and I use them a lot because um, they make more sense at work to pull out in the kitchen than this. You know, I don't want to mm -hmm. freak anyone out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I find that um, M390, 20CV, or the the super steels are great for the kind of knife you're designing yeah well i'll be honest with you i'm not super uh, like uh, what do they call it steel snobby you know i've got mm -hmm. knives everything from the the very low low kind of chinese unmarked steel right yeah. up to <laughs> your, your higher end uh, uh, steel knives that i collect and sometimes the cheaper ones get just as much as much use yeah. Uh, just because uh, they're lying there, I just pull it out. I'm not worried about oh, am I gonna am I gonna scratch the beautiful you know satin finish on on the Sabenza? Is that gonna annoy me, uh, etc.? And I can just whip out. But as I've started to to use knives and especially design them, I've become a lot less worried about marking up my knives. You know. Uh, I, I did attempt to clean some uh, of these <laughs> knives uh, before I came on, and I don't think my camera's quite good enough to pick it on, but it's got residue from everything on it, because yeah. the reality is I use these knives on, on a daily basis, you know, all of them. <laughs> so, not maybe not all of them, but whatever's lying closest to me at the, at yeah. the time, or whatever I find in my pocket, so... I'm not I'm not overly worried about the steel as long as it gets the job done and I find most most steels if they're kept well get the job done. But it's always nice to have that added bonus, something like M three ninety. You don't need to worry about sharpening it every second yeah. day. Yes. Uh, you know, it's just a nice steel all round, get the job done, stick it out use it every day for five months and then maybe it'll need a touch up if you're lucky. So Yeah. 
And and from a business perspective, I I, I don't know. I've never um, I've never done this before uh, in terms of making knives, but I have glanced at at steel prices uh, mm. now and again, and and there is a difference, but it's not such a radical difference it's not. Um, that reflects in that you will see reflected in mm. the finished product. Now I understand yeah. that. It's more expensive to work those steels because they're harder and they take more expendable materials like sanding, like grinding belts and, and mm -hmm. other things like that. So it's a more costly process and I get that. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is featuring a blade steel like M390 on your designs more easily justifies you charging a price that uh, someone who's not a giant mm -hmm. knife company should be charging. Yeah. Um, and and I, I'm unsure of what your knives cost here in the states but i'm guessing around 200 bucks or something like that i think it's just below probably about a uh, for, for the v1 i think it's in the 150 to 170 range uh, it's all messed up now because the pounds hit an all-time right. low hasn't it and right. um i think for the v2 you're probably spot on there about uh, the 190 to 200 range in dollars yeah and um yeah <laughs> We actually had to increase our prices, but it wasn't because uh, purely the cost of steel. It, it, we more so found the cost of manufacturing and shipping has uh, oh, increased yeah. astronomically. You know, I'll give you a, an example, and I, I don't want to talk too much about figures and bore people, but our shipping costs were about 150 to 200% more than than usual and wow. the issue cited was the the ongoing um, war in Ukraine now I don't know how that would have an impact on it but then I checked the tracking and usually our shipments come through to Europe Germany um, or the Netherlands and then to the United Kingdom but this shipment went all the way to the United States and then to the United Kingdom oh, so wow. it averted Europe entirely until it got to the UK as a flight path so I'm not I'm not entirely sure uh, why exactly if that is to do with something going on over there or not but it certainly had an impact on the cost so we increased our prices when we first launched the V1. It was a hundred and five Great British pounds, and now it's a hundred and thirty-five, mm -hmm. and uh, that as well is because of tax in the UK as well. Once you hit a certain threshold, you have to become VAT registered, i.e., you need to start charging people twenty percent tax, so that the cost oh, yeah. goes up. Wow, twenty percent, jeez. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> it's a with size chunk, <laughs> yeah, my gosh, twenty. Uh, so, uh, with materials, discussion of materials, uh, thinking of that double detent system, is this something that you can embed or or fix to micarta and to carbon fiber yes. and all different? Okay, so you're not married okay. to uh, by materials to no. titanium, no. Not at all. Uh, I'm not. I'm not married, but uh, to any materials, I, I'm always looking to kind of have a look and and see what's popular, what I feel would would be really nice and work well on a knife. Um, my carta is certainly something I've looked into before. Carbon fiber as well. Um, all of these knives, uh, the V two and and the the V one, they they could both be made in you know a large variety of materials. You could do a budget one with um a cheaper steel and say g10 or mm. or um you, you could even do it and i wouldn't want to go down to this level but in you know super cheap materials like plastic unnamed kind of like dollar station knives the thing that adds the kind of a uh, overall feel and impact to the knife though is the material so i would never want to cheapen it to to such an extent where it's something that i wouldn't really want to pick up you know sure, but sure, sure. I, I do have you know knives that are 20 30 dollars you know there's the the luna which i absolutely love it's in d2 and a g10 and you could do the exact same thing with with a who knives and those materials but i feel like um having you know, it adds a certain element of class having it in mm -hmm. titanium or one of, or one of these more. I'm not going to say sought after, but more premium materials. Um, certainly, when I 
look at a knife I am zoomed in from a design aspect of of what materials they're using what the blade shape is um, what's unique about this knife com compared to other knives and that can be something as simple as maybe it's got a, a lovely pivot collar you know that another knife doesn't have and I, it really catches my eye or it's a unique colour etc so I, I'm always looking at different materials and thinking what, what could I do next really so where does this all come from uh, for you? Uh, have you always been a collector or have you always had this interest in knives? Yeah, so I'm a collector at heart, not just in, in knives. I love uh, things like uh, watches as well. I love uh, Pokemon stuff. So I'm a bit of a, a geek. But uh, when it comes to knives, yeah, I've collected knives I would say all my life, but that wouldn't be true. Probably since you know early twelve, thirteen, when you st when right. you start to get into that uh, boyish kind of way, and you're picking up things and fiddling with them and seeing what you can do with them. You know, getting into your dad's drawers and picking out his knives or whatever. You know, and that's <laughs> where the kind of the kind of love came from. You know, for for Christmas last year, I bought my dad a a nice slip joint, and my hands are a bit bit sweaty so i can't open it but is that the gitano no it's a it's oh. a taylor's eye witness Ooh. um it's it's not this is actually a really budget friendly knife as well this was a uh, 30 pounds so what's that 40 to 45 dollars something like that but they do extremely high-end knives as well and uh, these are kind of traditional knives designed and, and made in the UK. One of the few manufacturers that I find left actually in the UK. So as I kind of reminisce on, on the past, I bought my father one of those knives uh, exactly the same. So we're twins with them. Because <laughs> I, oh, that's I cool. used to always take his knives and I don't know if he got many of them back. <laughs> so it's it's interesting you say that uh, about because uh, Sheffield, England, is mm. known for uh, its blades and knife manufacturers. One of the all-time capitals of of knife making. Mm. Um, so you have noticed, I guess, every country. We we talk about that here in the states all the time. Uh, manufacturing going overseas and such. But but you. So what's the climate there in terms of um, if you wanted to have a who knife made in england by an oem Impossible. there yeah without being you know where there's a will there's a way but it would take major investment i would need millions of pounds to start up a factory and and hire oh, workers okay. that were skilled in in manufacturing right. of of that kind of product because sadly they simply don't exist anymore you know and um, we have very few knife manufacturers in the united kingdom the ones that do exist uh, let me say their quality is is amazing but um they're more smaller custom makers and i don't say that in a condescending way but i'm just yeah. you know it's it they're not massive companies like spider co etc like you have in the united states uh, it's much more kind of family-run businesses and stuff like that now mm -hmm. and it's it's really sad to see and I'm not going to pretend like uh, I'm 50, 60 years old and seen the peak of, of uh, how big the industry was in Sheffield at the time, but I certainly know from the history books that it was world-renowned and still is to this day. You know, if people are still talking about the knives you make and um, there's very little people there making knives anymore, you must have been doing something right for it to last this long. Yeah, yeah. And then and then, and then, then it's just the uh, the almighty pound or dollar uh, mm. you know, in the last 50 years making decisions, you know, and sending, right. sending it all overseas. And the, and the, and the thing about that, that, uh, has, has been occurring to me lately is that you, you might gain something in terms of, uh, manufacturing, uh, really high end, nice manufacturing can be done overseas for, for a lot less than it can be done here. You lose it. What you gain is that, you know, great product for a, a better price, but, you lose, of course, jobs in your own country, but you also lose like the the cultural memory that led mm. up to to the having us and the heritage of of it all. Yeah. 
yeah and the knowledge too that led yeah. up to oh, course, you know yeah. uh, whatever the apex of american knife making or whatever the That's apex right. of sheffield knife making was um you lose all that you send it over there and 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 all that stuff gets sacrificed on the altar of uh efficiency which yeah. you know i don't know it's not always good well i'll be honest with you if i could have the the who knives manufactured in the united kingdom it would you know I, yeah. if i had a million pounds i'd pay for it myself but unfortunately it's just not cost effective as a business because yeah. one there isn't the facilities to do so and two for example, I did actually reach out to one gentleman I know who's a custom maker back at the beginning of all of this, and I asked, you know, what's what would the logistics be like? And he said, what? So you want you want me one person to manufacture three hundred pocket knives? I'll, and I, then he wouldn't be able to do his own custom orders. Sure. He would be taken off the field for a year, two years, goodness knows how long that would take to manufacture such a large amount. And then the price tag that would come with it, because it's, you know, uh, manufactured in the UK, handmade by one gentleman, you're talking anywhere from 400 to 600 uh, pounds. So, you know, quite a, a big premium put on that. And I'm not taking away from, from anybody's work here, but the reality is, you know, not a lot of people, including myself, have six, 700 pounds to spend on a pocket knife every right. every week, you know? So, yeah. That's the dilemma I hear from American designers, people who, who are in your okay. shoes all the time. You know, I, there's nothing I'd like more than to have something produced in the United States. And actually, uh, there is um, uh, 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 Devo Knives, uh, who is an American company, and they're, they're, it's two designers, uh, one of whom is Lefty EDC on, on YouTube. And they just had one of a version of one of their knives manufactured by an OEM in the states, and I'm very excited. I'm I I don't uh, haven't seen it yet. I mean, I've seen pictures of it, haven't held it yet. Um, but that's an exciting thing. But it's not something that they can do and maintain their business uh, mm. straight across the board. It's it's a special proof of concept yeah. kind of thing. But who knows? Maybe it grows from there. You know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, a lot of. Uh custom knife makers in the united states just kind of similar to what you were saying they'll make their custom pieces but then they'll have their production models which are sold on their websites etc as well at a, a much cheaper price so that you know anybody who who wants to own one can save up for for a month or two and, and pull the trigger on one which i think is great um it is a dilemma that you know we're always fighting with you know uh, people are upset that things aren't manufactured in the uk but then at the same time and i'm not of course it doesn't stand for everybody but they maybe wouldn't want to pay the price if it was if they knew the cost you know yeah. if i if i told one of my customers or if i pulled my customers you know and i i said to them would you pay for this if it was six, seven hundred pounds, but it was made in the United Kingdom? I'm sure many would say yes, simply for that, you know, because it is made in the UK and they want to support a UK business. But I think the vast majority would say it's probably a bit out of my, my budget, including, you know, uh, for all the stuff I've got to pay for. I've got my rent, I've got kids, etc. So it's a yeah. lot of money. To, to be laying down unless the cost of manufacturing could be brought down it's, it would just be unrealistic sadly yeah and if you're paying that kind of money you're gonna get a custom anyway you know yes exactly so from this picture uh uh the top left picture of the v2 it looks from the picture as if they're hollow ground blades are they mm. so the blade um it's a very unique uh, kind of shape. I'll let you have a closer look at it here. It's I don't know what you would want to call this, but <laughs> it's, I've it, genuinely not seen any knife with this kind of strange shape. But it came to me in a vision. <laughs> I'm only kidding. It's just what hit the hit the pad when I was drawn. But uh, yeah. I think it's quite. It's quite. It's a very unique shape, but it's also yeah. very pretty to, to to look at. But it'll get the job done as well. Whereas the the V ones are very kind of standard. Um, <laughs> you know, draw a knife on a bit of paper kind of shape. Um, so it's unique and it's a it's a little bit different and quirky. 
and uh, some people have said it looks quite tactical, which I don't know if it's great for for the UK market. I don't know what your take on that is. Oh, I, is. I I actually said that in my in my intro. I I think it oh, does look you? tactical. Apologies, but, but, I didn't but, hear. But, but when I say tactical, I don't necessarily mean like it looks like something a soldier is going to carry mm, into yeah. combat. It just has some of the um, some of the lines of mm. a tactical knife. Yeah, the, the aspects the of it. Yeah, the blade that grind the closest thing, and I don't think it really, but, but the closest thing, I would say it looks, uh, it reminds me somewhat of um, Rick Hinderer Knives' Sponto. Yes, that's, you know what I mean? that's a good way of, of putting it, and it's funny because I have one of their slippies just sitting up there. I don't want oh, to grab God. it because I'll run away, but that's one of the knives that I, I regularly use. So and sorry if you can hear banging. That is my uh, one-year-old son deciding to oh. hit off my door. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, that's cool. I remember uh, reaching out to you to come on the show right right before he was born. It was bad timing, but uh, congratulations! Right. I appreciate uh, that. You you've got a, a future uh, a future who knives uh, <laughs> carrier in your ear running around the house. Maybe we'll what get him designing. Start them young. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a. I have a bunch of illustrations that my daughters have drawn of knives over the years, and and my younger daughter, she always has blood on them. She's she's got a little <laughs> darkness. She's cute as can be, but she's got a little darkness in there. Um. So, uh, who knives? What is the? Where does the name come from? And you have you've got a really cool logo. Uh, mm. Tell me about that. So the the logo is based on the the Sutton Who helmet, which was trying to get it in a nice shot there. Oh, there we go. I'm not sure if you can see that all right. Oh, in fact, here's an even better way to do it. But you'll find this at the... Oh, yeah. The Bri- you'll find this at the British Museum, and it was um, said to be the helmet of a king. Now, how true that is, uh, we, we don't know, but kings back in these times, when, when this helmet was constructed, maybe aren't what uh, we think of nowadays with crowns on their heads. They often, you know, went into battle themselves, especially like Viking kings, etc. So... Th- these uh, there's actually a movie about it I believe called The Dig as well in case anybody's really interested in, in the historical uh, kind of backdrop of it but that's where the helmet comes from and because we're a British company I wanted something kind of iconically British that um, doesn't maybe get uh, the recognition that it deserves so we went with the, with the Sutton Hoo helmet uh, in that regard and interestingly enough they also it wasn't quite a knife but they pulled out a sword in the same burial site oh, cool. um, as, as well so that's so is that somewhat local to you where that was uh no unearthed? but it, it's actually not local uh at, at all to us it's out uh ipswich area uh sutton Hoo, so kind of like um i'm there ish on okay. the map uh, on my <laughs> finger um Maybe down a little bit, uh, but I think it's around there, and uh, it's not local to me because I'm away up here. Right, right, but it's it's, <laughs> but it's iconically. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's iconically right. British because it's it's one of the, uh, you know, I don't want to get too political, but a lot of people maybe uh, will say when they go into the British Museum, is there anything that's actually British here? Because uh, mm. a lot of the stuff's pulled <laughs> yeah. from different parts of the world and sure. what was once uh, the Empire and is now the Commonwealth, etc. But this, you could say, it genuinely is. You know, it was pulled out of uh, of uh, British soil and uh, excavated and put, put in the British Museum and on display. They've touched it up beautifully. Uh, and it's it's the the representation of what they feel like it would have been back uh, in the day when the wearer did wear it. So wow, that's yeah. So a British company, and you're using this uh, very iconic British imagery. Uh, as a company, you do other things besides design and release knives. You also um, you sell Civivi and Wee knives, and when I saw that, I was like, "That's interesting," because I understand why you would, but I mm. I don't understand how you can. I guess you said okay. you can buy them, you just can't walk around with them. Exactly. So Civivi, I I personally use quite a lot of Civivi knives around the house and at work because one reasonable excuse and 
touch wood I'm never at court but if I am my reasonable excuse would be you know I was working so I had to have a pocket knife when I was doing such and such um, and I often use the VV's uh, locking knives when, when I'm in the shop working etc getting stuff done because uh, I do want you know a, a really safe lock up for some tasks that I, that I can rely on and I think things like the Elementum are, are a lovely really sleek design easy to pull out the pocket doesn't weigh much at all and it's a great knife so I wanted to offer that to, to our customers as well so I applied um, to be a Civivi and Wee Knives retailer in the United Kingdom and uh, they graciously approved and um, we, we stocked up on, on some of their products that I, I haven't used all of the products that we stock but some of them are requests from people uh, and some of them just look absolutely fantastic as well. But uh, I don't have many Civivi or Wee Knives in the lineup at the moment. Uh, I do have a mini banter, which is is oh, nice. nice. Uh, I really like the fidget factor on that knife. Um, but sadly, again, even though it's such a small blade, I, I couldn't carry it outside without a reason, which uh, maybe baffles some people, but the blade has to be that kind of small length. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I mean, like you mentioned... Uh... That is the case in cities like Chicago and New York, yeah. and 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 a lot of it is is a very vaguely written law too. So mm -hmm. it's kind of up to how much the the police officer dislikes you, you know. Um, so can you sell things like uh, this? This made um, this is the Praxis by Civivi, and it made my list of great gift knives. Um, and it's it's one of the oldest Civivi models, but it's got a three point seven five inch. Uh, locking blade can you bring it it's something large like that in e even though so it's presumed that, it's not going to be carried yes but here's where i add a million asterisks um if it's on the banned weapons list no and the band's weapons list is extensive so things like uh, butterfly knives switch blades uh, gravity knives um <laughs> locking flipper knives um knuckle dusters with a knife attached these kind of some of them uh, are preposterous like you'd think what sort of person is is gonna have these in their house unless they are for display or just for you know having having fun with uh, so i don't it, the laws in the uk are just sad they make me sad to be honest with you oh. but there's no appetite to change them uh, the, yeah. uh, the last time they changed was 2019 and they got stricter so yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the kind of appetite there is here uh, on and again it's it's um the media gives knife such a bad name yeah. uh, on top of uh, politicians that think you know if they make a catch if they make a pocket knife illegal it's going to somehow stop some lunatic going into his local no, no. you know supermarket yeah. and picking up a, a machete and going out and doing whatever nasty things a lot of it comes down to in my opinion politicians are so out of touch with with the general public in the united kingdom that um and maybe it's the same in in the United yes. States, that the laws reflect their kind of uh, fears rather than the general public's. You know, I don't. I've never had anybody run away screaming when I've pulled a, a little pocket knife out to cut a, a box or whatever. I've never had anybody scream at me on the street that I'm breaking the law or etc. But that is kind of the the way that the politicians act, etc. It's maybe not in. Uh, it's, they maybe think they're out to do the right thing, but it doesn't really always no. uh, pan out that way. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, they don't. They're not doing it because they think they're doing the right thing. Uh, almost in every case, even in the best case, they're doing it because it's good for them in their career. Well, At least in the United States where, you're, where, where there are no term limits. They're just doing what they to... think people want to see. Oh, yeah. I'm being effective, uh, so I'm going to outlaw. So I live in a you're state of, yeah. of Virginia where uh, this, thanks to knife rights, is finally legal. And, uh, but but the, the governor, you know, before the current governor, uh, got, got himself in some, in some uh, trouble and he was looking like a, a politically incorrect buffoon. And so he, it, he, he, turned the, he turned the focus on automatic knives that they wanted to have legalized. He's like, no, we're not going to do that. 
And it cost a whole bunch of jobs in a depressed part of Virginia that wanted to set up a knife company that was going to make these kind of things. And he said no, because he himself had gotten himself in hot water. So in my opinion, uh, at least in the United States, I can't speak for the, the United Kingdom, but I mean, yeah, it's kind of the same job everywhere, though. You know, That's politician interesting. Is trying to get reelected. Um, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it's often the way our 99% of politicians are like that nowadays, um, where they're, they're looking out for their own self interests and what, you know, if they're not going to be elected next, what big job are they going to land at some fancy farm yeah, next day right. uh, to screw us over in another way? But, uh, you know, that it's the sad reality, the political landscape in, in the West is in a sorry state of affairs, uh, but I suppose that's a story uh, for, for another day, but it is interesting that, you know, one, one man, the governor, can have so much power over over legislation, and I'm really glad that got uh, cleared up for you, and you can own something like that. Sitting over here, I'm very jealous, because uh, yeah. I would love to own... Uh, automatic knives and that was actually what the the latest uh, bill legislation brought into the United Kingdom you used to be able to own but not this is how silly the law is you used to be able to own but not buy automatic uh, blades and and switch blades but now they've they've outlawed them completely and they expected everybody to surrender them uh, by a certain deadline date so if you have one now even in your own home then you're breaking the law Uh, it's crazy it's it's crazy you know Uh, and this is it's not stopping crime it's not you know taking away it's not taking bad guys off the streets what it's doing is it's impacting small businesses and it's impacting collectors that want yeah. to have something cool uh, t- to use uh, and edc lovers as well so for for any good it does uh the the bad outweighs it i would say um big big time yeah I would say the raw exercise of power never results in anything good. And that's all that this seems like, Um, you know, Uh, but like you said, that's a, that's a story for another rant. (laughs) But um, so I want to know about the future of who knives, Uh, what, what kind of, um, where do you want the, the company to go? What kind of other products, uh, what other kind of knives are you looking to make? In, in in the United Kingdom, can you make, um, can you have fixed blade knives like for camping and that kind of thing? Is that another uh, avenue? So again, absolutely. You can own fixed blades, but they're classed uh, in the same legislation as locking knives. So mm-hmm. In the UK, uh, a judge once determined that um, a blade, a folding knife once locked is classed as a fixed blade. Mm-hmm. So that's why uh, locking blades are banned because once they're deployed uh, under British law, they're classified as a fixed blade it's not going anywhere let's be realistic so Mm -hmm. you can see the logic in it but unfortunately it impacts us in such a negative light so i i could go into these realms of even having a locking knife or a fixed blade but the reality is i want to stick to to uk legal so that's non-locking sub three inch uh, blades whether it's slip joints or double detents and that's because that's where um that's why Who Nice was founded, you know, to try and fill this gap in the market, um, to have these kind of uh, different designs of knives that you can flip open, that you can't do with uh, other UK legals, etc., and fill that that void. And we've achieved that somewhat, and um, hopefully we can keep going down that route. I would never rule out doing something like... Uh, a locking knife etc but from a business standpoint it doesn't make much sense you know 90% right, right. of our customers are British uh, so they're going to want something that they can carry and use on a daily basis yeah yeah when I asked you the fixed blade question I wasn't taking into consideration that you don't have the same hunting culture uh, no. that we that we have so I mean there's a, a, a huge market for hunting knives you know fixed blade mm. knives that are completely unthreatening so to speak they're not combat knives they're not fighting knives they're little hunting knives but um, yeah that's probably not even there's probably very 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 little demand mm. for that so, so yeah I, I 
I, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, I just want to agree folks. with you that I think that you have filled um, the 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 niche you were looking to fill because I can't think of anyone else. <laughs> there, there is some companies out there, you know. I'm not going to discredit everybody. Spider Co has been great. They've developed some some UK legal designs. I was looking down because they've done a smaller version of this called the Urban, which has proved very popular as as well in the UK. But um, in terms of like double detent folders with high end materials, um, at what I'd like to suggest is a reasonable uh, cost. Uh, it's not. OTT pricing, you know, I want to make it in the realm so that if you can afford, you know, you can save to get it if you can't afford to get it straight away because that's what I do with a, with a lot of my pocket knives, etc. I set aside a little bit of money and get it so it's not mm. crazy priced um, like like some of the kind of uh, other knives out there which are justifiably high priced if they're manufactured in the likes of the states etc because the manufacturing's not cheap <laughs> right, right yeah so um I, when i said i can't think of anyone i know that there are people making um double detent there are big companies mm. but but you're um you are it's for us by us you're there making mm. it yeah, uh, designing so it for for your um your countrymen and for your needs but but kind of bringing it right up to the level like because it's fidgety like like uh like the kind of knife you can't own it it has the same sort of blade geometry it has the same sort of ergonomics and look and you mm. can flip it and you can pop it out with your with your thumb so you're giving it you're you're taking it right up to the line i think that that's really cool because um you know that. yeah yeah because that means uh people like you over there can have that knife too and experience all the you know the fun stuff and that <laughs> is where all of this came from uh bob to be honest with you it's the fact that you know i remember uh i got asked a couple of questions off knife news once and they says well you know what made you want to design this knife and the honest answer is it was a knife for me i designed it <laughs> for myself you know and no matter how selfish that may sound or be that's exactly why i done it I, I designed it because it's a knife that i wanted to have to carry you know for hopefully the the rest of my life uh, and it be legal so long as the laws don't change in the uk etc and then when i had the design i thought you know, I could really do something with this here. The, the this is actually, you know, I didn't expect it to become a reality as quick as it did. To be honest with you, but uh, I just went along with it, and I'm so glad that there was so much interest from people in the United Kingdom and around the world. I've been so grateful for mm. for the messages we get of people carrying them, and we do have Americans that uh, carry them as well nowhere near as many british and, and germans but we we do have uh, quite a lot of uh, american users as well which is fantastic you know taking the uh, double detents and uk legals internationally is yeah. uh, always it's always going to put a smile on my face but my aim is always going to be my own market so it's always going to be the uk that's that's the reality of it and it just so happens that uh, german knife laws are super similar not exactly the same but very similar in the sense of uh you know the sub three inches and non-locking etc you know a uh, funny thing is or the irony is uh when i was a kid in the 80s and 90s uh i had a chance to go to europe a couple of times and that's where we got switchblades it's like going to germany getting a switchblade yeah. and i think my sister brought one back to me uh in the 80s from the uk so it's just funny that kind of uh, well, our our laws were real strict on that and it's yeah. sort of changed. It's changed. Um, that yeah, is interesting, a, isn't it? Yeah, How yeah. the tables turn. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Hopefully everyone just kind of gets a little bit of, of common sense, but I I really like that you are um that you specialize on in your country and your specific knife laws. Uh because yeah, the rest of the world actually really does have strict knife laws it's it's pretty much the universal 
Mm, yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, I was even speaking to, to one of our manufacturers, um, or we, we only have one manufacturer, one of the gentlemen that works with the manufacturer, and uh, I asked him, you know, that they're manufactured in China, by the way, full disclosure, and I said to him, is it even legal for you to carry half of the stuff that you make? And it's not. It's, it's not. You know, they're oh, making no. these knives for, for Western countries, and in a, in a lot of cases... It's not legal to carry in in uh, in China, so which is really interesting um, to to say the least. But you're right, especially in Europe, we have, you know, we're world renowned for being quite strict on what some would classify as weapons, um, mm-hmm. like uh, guns, fire, any kind of firearm, and knives, uh, you know truncheons whatever whatever kind of thing you want to call them but the the difference with with a knife is if i called this a weapon and sold it it would be illegal but it's a tool so it's classified as legal uh, our laws are very strange in that in that sense as well where you're not allowed to sell anything for for the purpose of using as a weapon yeah but um you know uh, it certainly as anything could be if it was used in a negative way could be used in in that manner yeah it's uh the weapon is in here as they yeah, like to say 100% uh, if you had um if you had the opportunity to collaborate or have a any knife company in the world make one of your designs uh who would it be such a tough question um, <laughs> because there's so many great uh, knife companies out there but I'll be honest with you I'm going to come back to the kind of uh, the soft spot in me it would be uh, MBK oh, nice. but, and I, I just think they make such clean designs such beautiful efficient knives um, and I would love to get my hands on one of Ray's custom pieces and I really don't want to insult him by butchering his last name not pronouncing it right <laughs> but uh yeah it would definitely probably be a- a- mbk i just think their knives are just world class and for the price range as well it's actually really similar to ours uh believe it or not for the v1 is is priced quite similar to to some of their um knives and they also done a double detent knife as well mm-hmm. um is it the ewc I think it's the EWC. I, I um, think so too. I could be wrong, but I'm terrible at remembering names. But uh, that that's a fantastic knife as well. The difference is, I think it's a front flipper um, rather than a you know a, a traditional flipper. And um, so I would love to work to work with them in some sense of the light. So what are what available products do you have uh, for people right now? It's really, really frustrating, but because we are such a small company, I can't physically afford to to do tons of production runs. You know, for example, when I first started Who Knives, I put my entire life savings into it. I sold basically everything I had in terms of financial value, like games consoles and stuff. My entire knife collection, apart from one or two pieces that had sentimental value, eh... Uh, uh, was sold and the the couple of pieces stuck with me. Um, so the only thing we have at the moment is the V two, and we've got it in two different colorways or variants. We have the blackout, which I believe we only have five or six left of, not many at all. And then um, the stone washed and and satin, which we have plenty of stock of over a hundred. Um, I would love to get to the point where I'm able to stock my V one, the V two, and mm-hmm. all the different mm-hmm. colorways as well. Because you know we've done a sand washed finish on the V two with a satin blade. We've done a stone washed finish with a satin blade. We've done a stone washed finish with a stone washed blade. <laughs> we've done uh, a blackout. Uh, v1 as well and with the v2 we've just got the two uh, different designs at the moment the blackout and the the satin and stone wash so ideally we want to be able to stock all of these different varieties at the same time (laughs) yeah but but uh i'm i'm impressed for your um for your size uh that you have the v2 on hand that's that's pretty great i know a lot of people 
uh, tend to do things in drops. And if you're not mm. paying attention at that moment, you miss out. And that's always a bummer. So it's cool that you have these uh, V2s available. Well, I try to get as much stock as, as possible, to be honest with you. But from a financial standpoint, it, is, it can be quite hard uh, when when you're looking at uh, so so much coming out of the company account, etc. And you're... Yeah. And you're thinking, goodness, I've got, I've got, you know, two thousand worth of bills next month that I've got to pay, um, etc. So that's why we've got limited stock, but we will build it up. Uh, we will build up our CVV stock again as well. Um, I'm just about to place another CVV order in the next few days, actually, because I've seen that they've got some new knives that I think will be really nice. Um, the the wee banter with wood handles now. I I thought that looked. I think it was a mini banter actually. So we'll get some of them in uh, uh, as well, and I, I get why people do these drops, like build hype up around the product, etc. And if that works for you, by all means, don't don't let me be the one to try and stop anybody from from a. Uh, having a successful business but i like you say i like to try and have a uh, knife on hand in case somebody wants to buy one or they've been saving for it for a while not mm -hmm. everybody's got the capital right at that second to pull the trigger yeah. etc so we, we try to keep uh, the the knives well stocked this is our first run of the of the v2 and we got 250 of these made and each are numbered um, one to two hundred and fifty for the first production run. Bear with me. So if you get a wee box, this is the box it comes in, and they'll come with their number there, and the numbers also on on the blade of the knife as well, just to kind of signify that this is the the first production run, and nice. um, future production runs, uh, they they don't all come with that, like um. For example, we only had 50 blackouts made, so we put M390 on the blade instead of instead of a unique number just to signify that it wasn't a full production run. So right. things like that, um, it was a bit quirky, but uh, some collectors actually really like it. You know, we've had uh, a few gentlemen messages and ask if they can buy our prototypes just as a collector's piece. Oh. As a kind of drawer queen, um, and the the reality is, I don't like to to sell them because I don't feel like it's the finished product. You know, when I when one yep. of our knives hit your doorstep in a package, I want you to open it and be like, "This is brilliant." I don't want you to open it and think, "Oh, well, this bit, you know." I wonder what they changed. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, it, it is what it is, but it's always really nice to to. If someone wants to buy a prototype, if they like the knife that much, then I'm honoured uh, to, to be asked such a thing, uh, to be honest with you. Well, Carl, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I think it's really cool uh, how you are stepping up uh, and making knives for you and your countrymen and people who... who... <laughs> suffer under these oppressive knife laws no i i really think it's cool yes. because you're giving people uh something uh that's an opportunity to have a knife uh similar to ones that they can't have mm -hmm. and and i and and in doing so you're making something unique and beautiful all on their own so congratulations sir i look forward to seeing how who Thank knives grows much. i really appreciate you having me on the show it's been a blessing thank you very much I appreciate ah, that. quite a pleasure sir take care take care Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.